And uh, good evening from Kampala, Uganda. Yes, I know you're in morning. This is morning time in California. I would like to welcome everyone to today's, uh, the second in the three part series of our webinars, the Buddha Africa webinars. And also like to thank you especially Christine and the San Diego Supercomputer Center for hosting us today. We have, uh, today we're gonna to be hearing the country perspective from Kenya and Ethiopia, from very senior members of the Buddha and Africa team. If you go to the next slide, Christine. Yes, yeah, so I bring you greetings from Professor Miriam, who is unable to join us. She's also attending another uh, program related to the Bodan Africa project. So she sends her greetings and uh, uh, good wishes as well. I would like to welcome everyone from Uganda, from Kenya, from Ethiopia, from Nigeria, from Tunisia, from, I've seen somebody from Oklahoma, uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Research Innovations Consultancy and Extension from Kampala International University is here. Professor DG would like to welcome you and uh, he's going to be giving us some closing remarks later in the day. So part of today's program, before we listen to our senior members of the project from Kenya and Ethiopia, I'm going to be introducing the Vodan and Vodan Africa in general, in just in brief. The Virus Outbreak Data Network is an initiative of the GoFair Foundation, and the aim is simply to make sure that, okay, we've had several outbreaks in the past, and what happens, did we really learn any lessons from them? Maybe, can we really access the data from those past outbreak and see what we can learn if there are similar patterns with the current outbreak? In most cases, the answer is no. So the idea is to have a global open data system that the data is findable, it is accessible, it is interoperable and reusable. So the data will remain under the governance of each country of the location for Uganda. It is under the governance law of the country of Uganda for Tunisia, for Kenya, for Ethiopia. But somebody in China may want to learn some certain patterns from the situation in Uganda. So computing algorithms from Kenya will be able to assess the data in Uganda and then assess the patterns, understand the architecture and learn the necessary lessons from them. So it is interoperable, every operating system, every platform, it gives uniform outputs. And then we come to Vodan Africa. The idea behind Vodan Africa is to inject African expertise into the virus outbreak data network. So it is a project by Africa for Africans from Africa to the world. It is a partnership thing between universities, ministries of health, health regulatory agencies, data scientists, machine learning experts in Africa and our counterparts in Europe from the University of Leiden, from the GoFair Foundation from Tilburg. And the initiative is funded by the Philips Foundation. We continue to thank them. And also we have received support from different governments of different countries who are not really even part of the, Gov uh, the Vodan Africa initiative. We started the Vodan Africa. Uh, the first press release was on the 19th of March, 2020. But between that time and now, when we started fully in April, we have made some groundbreaking initiatives. We held the first metadata for machines workshop for the COVID-19. The first one for the COVID-19 was held in Africa and under the Bodan Africa initiative. We have a group of graduate students who are data stewards from universities in Africa. We have researchers, we have healthcare professionals, who have partnered together to form part of the train, the trainers workshop. And the idea is, the dream is to expand this beyond the, uh, the COVID-19. So we have a body of experts who are being groomed as data stewards who are going to help to expand the initiative of modern Africa beyond the COVID-19. It's also an opportunity to build a new workforce. Now we're bringing the fair principle expertise to Africa. So we have partnership with uh, Rabu Works, an indigenous African company being run by African, owned by Africans. And they have been 
responsible for part of the technical development and they're responsible for also the technology transfer so that at the end of the day, most of the things we have to like look up to Europe to do for us, we can always do them here in Africa. It gives an opportunity to build infrastructure, data infrastructure for future crisis. Now we have a different kind of science coming into the COVID-19. There has been talk about vaccines, about medications, about treatment regime, and so on. But data is one thing that is going to help us. Science of fair data is one thing. And Africa is part of the pioneer of a fair data points for the COVID-19. Right now we have them in six countries and nine universities in Africa, and which is really actually a pioneer initiative. We're looking at prevention, we're looking at direction to resources, we're looking at learning. Data will help us. Algorithms will visit this data, understand the pattern based on the goal fair, fair, fair data architecture, and then future lessons, future outbreaks, we'll be able to learn lessons from this initiative. We want to thank all our partners and uh, everyone who has provided support. Today is a fully packed day because we're going to be hearing from our senior experts, healthcare professionals, health informatics professionals, computer scientists, NGO, and everyone who is involved with the Bodan project from Kenya and Ethiopia. Christine, please, if you go to the next slide. So we're going to be hearing from Dr. Asma, who is one of the directors in Kenya is also one of the coordinators, a sub-country coordinator for the Bodan Africa project from Kenya. She's the sub-health director at uh, Westland Subcountry Hospital in Kenya. We have uh, Ms. Whitney, who is also uh, coordinating an NGO on the COVID-19 in Kenya. And we have Dr. Reginald, who is the country coordinator and a professor from Tangaza University. In Ethiopia, we're going to be featuring one of the country coordinators, Dr. Wondimu Ayele from Addis Ababa University, and Dr. Araya from Mekele University, who has been like an interface between the Bodan Africa and the management of Mekele University. Christine, if you go to the next slide, we can take a look at their profiles. Next slide, please, Christine. Yes, sorry, just a, a moment. It paused the screen sharing. So let's see yeah, if I can. Sorry. Oh yeah, no, it was. Uh, it, this is always the fun of doing the live, the live presentation and live demo. Let's see, there yes. we go. Okay. Okay, so here you have the profiles for the speakers from Kenya. They're going to be presenting the uh, the perspective from the COVID nineteen and then the Bodan African network. How data is going to help the situation in. Kenya. So Dr. Asma Ali Awald is a medical doctor and she's with the Ministry of Health in Kenya. She's very key to the Bodan Africa project and she's so passionate about the Bodan Africa project. She directs uh, the Westland Country Health and uh, she also leads the rapid, rapid response team for COVID-19 in the Westland subcountry in Kenya. We have Ms. Whitney Ateno Otieno. This is so exciting. She's actually a student and an activist and a peace advocate. She's so passionate about creating awareness among the youth around various issues that affect their life in the Majengo area of Kenya. And finally, we have Dr. Reginald Nalugala, who I've been working with since the beginning of this project. She is the country coordinator for Kenya and she has been doing a lot to bring in a lot of partners from the country. Kenya, after Uganda has the largest number of data stewards, and they're also enthusiastic about the project. Dr. Nalugala is a professor at Tangaza University, and she has been involved in so many health uh, outreach programs, both locally in Kenya, in East Africa, and internationally, in Italy, Netherlands, in the UK, and India. Dr. Reginald is so passionate about health at the grassroots, and you're all going to listen to him today while he gives his perspective on all the things he's doing in Kenya and on the Bodan Africa project. If you go to the next slide, please, Christine. All right. So we listen to our colleagues, our support 
and team members from Kenya. Uh, who is going first? It's Dr. Asma. Dr. Asma is going first. Okay, I was looking at the order of the name. So Dr. Asma, please, you go first and tell us about the good things you're doing in Kenya and they... Yes, Christine? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, uh, please go ahead. Are you ready for the next slide? I didn't oh, know if someone was doing an, if wanted an introduction with this slide or not. Well, I think we go to the next slide. Dr. Asma, this is Dr. Asma's slide. Greetings. Uh, yeah. I think Reginald was supposed to start us off. Then I take after Reginald. Oh, okay, Dr. Reginald, please. Okay, I, I can do that, yes. Yes, yes, I'll step in. Um, this is just a general overview where we are at the moment. Uh, as you can see the map of Kenya, you, you can hear me, I, I hope. <laughs> it's a problem with the internet, but I hope you can hear me. Yes, perfectly. Yes. perfectly. Okay, I think we jinxed it by saying we could hear you perfectly. Can all of you hear? Or is it? Uh, I think I can hear. I can take over. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Oh. Uh, so this is a general overview of Kenya. So the population has, but the recent, uh, recent census that was done last year is about 48 million. And Nairobi alone, as a county has 4.4 million. And the government announced the lockdown about 2nd of March to 12th of uh, May, though there could be an, uh, 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 an extension of that. But the strategy that was adopted is test, isolate, and treat, whereby we have uh, schools, colleges, university, and all uh, worship centers being affected with the lockdown and uh, services also stopped. The MOH is in support for VODA, very good support for the grassroots, and the government endorsed, and I thank the team for, we have the assembly. Next. Kristen. So th this is uh, uh, what, this is the situation that was yesterday, that we had tested about 32,938, 32, and we had 700 cases out of which we had 251 cases. And when you're looking at the, the, we have about 47 counties within the country. Out of them, we had about 19 counties being affected with the virus. Christine, next, please. So I'll take you through the part where I'll talk about what the Kenyan government is doing. And I will narrow it down to Western sub-county. And this is a mirror from what we do from the national level all the way to the county and the sub-county. The government is in three phases. We have the national government, we have the county government, and then we have the sub-county, whereby majority of the activities are usually ongoing. Please go to the next uh, slide. So in Westland sub-county, we have about five wards, namely Kitisuru, Parklands, Karura, Kangemi, and Mountain, West, uh, Mountain View. And within Westland sub-county, we have, we have some informal settlements which uh, High Ridge, Deep Sea, Gidogoro, Ndumbuini, Kibagare, Kangemi, and Suswa. Most yes, of the domestic workers, mm. I hope mm. everyone can hear me. Most of the domestic workers, security guards, or... I think she's talking. We should send her that link. Mm. How to behave when they are alone. Yes, Dr. Asma, we can hear you. We'll mute that other thing coming through. Sorry ah, about okay. that. Sorry. Sorry. So within Westlands, we have uh, several uh, informal settlements. And from this informal settlement, we usually have drawn of different casual laborers, domestic workers, and uh, also security guards. And that's where usually we have issue in, when it comes to any contagious disease or infection. Please go to the next. So this is just a picture showing you how many counties 
within the country. We have about 47 county, and within the country, we have about 19 county being affected with the virus currently. One or the other, we have three, four counties who are in lockdown, but the whole of the, 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 the nation is on curfew. But we have some parts within those county also where we're experiencing high, high level of transmission of COVID-19 virus. Please go to the next one. So um, when I was talking about the county, we find Nairobi is highly affected and we also have Mombasa running second to Nairobi. Initially, we had, uh, the graph is just showing where we're having imported cases and uh, local cases. Currently, we have over 73 cases which are, which are local transmission. And you find in Mombasa, which is now where we are putting more concentration because we have the highest number of local transmission vis-a-vis -vis the imported trans transmission. But when you're looking at Nairobi, we have both uh, local and transmission almost equaling one another. But Mombasa, the case is different. The majority of the other counties are having more or less local transmission of people who have moved from one county to the other one. Go to the next slide. Now, this is just a picture of what, uh, what we've been doing from the time that uh, the pandemic, before the pandemic was declared, and by the time we had our own, our first case being picked within Kenya. And at that time, uh, Initially, the government was doing targeting, targeting and following up of cases or in terms of asymptomatic and non asymptomatic, uh, symptomatic and the death. But by the time we are finding these cases were becoming high, we started a mandatory quarantine. And this was started somewhere end of March, where we have everyone who was coming in outside the country, who was coming in also from the active epidemiological outbreak area, were were okay they were mandatory required to do a quarantine of 14 days and after that they were tested to see if they were exposed or not exposed but with that we still had cases of asymptomatic patients among the ones who are doing targeted testing and the the curfew was started over 5 a.m to 7 p.m whereby most of the other activity within the country were also stopped like uh, schools uh itinerary areas mosques, churches, and public facility. And at this time also we started implementing that each and every person going to the public, public area need to have a facial mask. And we have recently, end of April, we have recently started doing mass testing to get a true picture of what exactly the, the virus uh, transmission is and maybe tailor some of the programs to ensure cut down of the virus. Please go to the next slide. Now, this slide is just showing the distribution. Uh, majority of the cases that we are having in our isolation center are actually asymptomatic and they are picked due to targeted testing. These are exposed to some of the symptomatic cases or some of the cases that were te who tested positive, either they were symptomatic or, asy or asy asymptomatic. So when we do the testing, we found most of the cases we're currently having in our isolation centers are actually asymptomatic vis-a-vis we have about 27% of this case or of the cases are symptomatic. Please, the next slide. This is just so the, in terms of gender, age, the, the, the distribution in terms of gender and age, uh, it's quite unique that more, at, at the country level, we're finding more male being affected and the age group of 30 to 39, Though when you're looking at the, the data for Mombasa, you find more women who are affected at that, actually that the age between 30 to 39 and 40 to 49. But majorly in Mombasa, in, in the whole of Kenya, we find more men who are, most of the cases that we're having in our, in, in our center are actually men than women. And majority of them are actually between that age group of 30 to 39. Next slide, please. So the key highlight of all the, the, the pie chart and the, and the graphs that we just uh, shown is majorly most of our cases that we are having are asymptomatic clients. And that's one of the things that actually sort of uh, uh, made us go towards mass testing. But initial, most of the numbers that we had were all coming in because of targeting testing 
and also managing the contract of the, the of exposed uh, clients that we're having. And uh, we wanted the mass testing to come on board so that we can have a clear picture of how we are doing and what method we can put to sort of cut, on the, cut down the transmission of the virus. And we have some of the non-pharmaceutical uh, pharmaceutical intervention that we, are, we have already put in place, like social distance. For those who can work at home and they don't need to go into the office, should work at home. Um, for everyone who is not needed to be outside there, should stay at home. All the was closure of all the schools and religious places. We minimize gathering of any kind, even for trainings. We minimize all gathering, even for burials, to a, a number not exceeding 15 people for any time, with place of social distance. Hand hygiene stations were placed in each and every place thermometer checking and also wearing of face mask in public setup. Uh, next slide, please. So at Western Subcounty, at the subcounty level, what we have done so far, we had formation of the rapid response team. And this team is the one, I did this team. This team responds to any, any issue pertaining to COVID-19 and is fully aware of each and every uh, question or each and every uh, circumstance that may be happening. And we had trained a pool of uh, COVID-19 TOTs who we have mandated to go on the ground to different facility. Westlands, we have over 50 facility, both public, faith-based and private. So we had the COVID-19 uh, pool of trainers going to each and every facility and do a sensitization. We initially started resource mobilization so that we can have enough protective uh, clothing, protective gears, so that it become easy for us to respond and also ensure the safety to the people who are responding and also do community sensitization. We had formed a multi-sectoral platform with different stakeholders. And with this, we formed some, what we call Western Disaster Team, which offer a great deal of support to the rapid response team. And we have among them the security agency. We have the police, we have the the CID units, we have the mosque, we have the churches, we have the community leaders, and also we have non-health organization. With that, we be, it becomes easy for us to manage and also evacuate and deal with quarantine and isolation issues without compromising an issue of culture or spiritual uh, terms. There was also identification of isolation and quarantine sites. We were able to identify which sites we can, we can quarantine our clients and also isolate the ones who have tested positive and do follow up uh, routinely, so we can be able to do supervised followers for both the quarantine and isolated clients. We also have a team within the rapid response team that is mandated to do the sample collection and transportation to the National Public Health Lab for testing and also cascade down the result to the Arab team, which will fo do follow up and manage the contact and do all the contact tracing. We also strengthened the referral system. We realized we didn't need to have speedy evacuation and also contact tracing of cases. So that when we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are told about a case, there is no delay in going down and see how we can, we can assist either to test or to evacuate, to take the client to isolation center or a quarantine center. Next slide, please. Christine, next slide, please. So we, we went ahead and go to the community level as well. We found out most of the local transmission were coming from the community. And by that, we, we did a lot of sensitization, a lot of education to the community leaders and community members, whereby we did sensitization on the virus itself to understand about the COVID-19 virus and also to understand the mode of transmission and how to stop uh, entry of the virus using this mode of transmission. We established most of the hand washing points within the market, within the entries of the most of the informal settlements, within some of the public access facilities or public access amenities. We also discouraged gathering. And with that, we also had the, the leaders, village leaders and elders coming on board to ensure there is no gather, gathering. There are no community dialogue. And if they are there, we, are, we have been uh, advocating for virtual meetings. There is public place disinfection whereby we have a team of public health officers that are coming from sub-county level to do disinfection of the, the, the public areas. We encourage face masks to be worn in all the public area. If there was any gathering of about 15 people, each and every person should maintain social distance and also wear a face mask. We educate on good cough and sneezing etiquette. We sensitize on social distance and it's important on cutting down the COVID-19 virus. There was uh, implementation or setting up of temperature check in each and every 
public area, especially when we're having the chief offices, the malls. We also shared the contacts of the response team member for reporting purposes of any issue or any, we had uh, established uh, a data of uh, calls centers that they can actually reach out, even if they want to just ask a question or get a clarification, to get assistance. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Asma. That was extremely interesting. And we had a few quick questions, if it's okay, while we're still on this topic. Uh, the sure. first one comes from Araya, who's asking, what is the testing apparatus you use for mass testing? Is it a rapid so, testing kit, and how sensitive no, is it? No, in, in Kenya, we're not using any rapid testing. We're still doing PCR. And the way we are doing it, we're, we're taking two swabs, one from the oral pharyngeal swab and one is nasal pharyngeal swab. We're not using any rapid test. So all the testing that we're doing are all PCR testing. Another question from uh, Professor DG: how are deaths recorded? Is it from hospital records? And how does it work if the death happens at home or up in other places? Now, uh, what happened, the, go the national government has actually put uh, a directive that any death of irrespective of the nature of the death especially if it's at home has to be reported to the rapid response team so we have also gotten the the different uh, groups leaders that in the cemetery so there's no barrier unless there is a COVID-19 test done to that uh, that dead body so for for the ones in the hospital we are able to know about the COVID status and they're recorded within the hospital. And immediately, if this particular client is positive or is a suspected positive, the rapid response team is usually called on the ground and it is reported almost directly to the, uh, to the Ministry of Health. For the home based, uh, for the home death, any person dying outside the health facility, the rapid response team is informed first to come on the ground, do the testing, irrespective of the cause of death, then give a certificate that is this one is COVID-19 negative or positive, and then the body will proceed within 24 hours. So if you die at home, you need to be ascertained about the test. If you die in the hospital, we still access those records. So, so far we were able to actually pick majority of our records for both hospital and outside hospital death. Thank you so much. We actually have a few more questions, but in the interest of time, we're going to move on uh, to Miss Whitney. And I want to thank you too for bringing in the art, um, the street art that is happening around this, because this just gives a new dimension that and, and showcases talent too as well. Thank you. Thank you. So Miss Whitney, uh, I turn it over to you. Let's make sure that your mute is off. Okay, I can see you, Whitney. <laughs> and I'll, un there you are, unmuted. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm with me at Tiano. I'm 19 years old. I am a student. I also work within the community under the umbrella of Kamukunti Community Peace Networking. I also help with providing food to the local families during these tough times. The next slide, please. Kamukonji sub-county affected by COVID-19 pandemic. I'm okay. Oh, Miss Whitney, your um, audio is dropping in and out. If it, is it possible for you to do audio only or looks like you're on mobile. So if it's not possible, that is okay too. Of 49.9%, male are 50.1%, youth below 18 are 37%, above 18, 61%. This is also where most radi radicalized youth came from. The sub-county medical teams are coordinating the campaign very well. The words 
the wards include Ngara, Nairobi Central, Isili South, Airbase and California. Next slide, please. Social distancing has brought in new challenge. For the youth, for the youth, dependent youth have engaged themselves in themselves in criminal activities. It has really increased now. They used more more tactics, more way of attacking. Rape has increased, violence on toddlers has really increased as small children are being raped each and every each and every day. Most residents in slums, they don't have running water in their houses. They have to get out to get the basic necessities like water and the use of communal toilets. Next slide, please. Breaking social distancing, hunger does not respect COVID-19. Loss of jobs during the lockdowns means hunger. Food distribution can lead to chaos and violence. Many people here, they don't go to work. Those who used to work in malls, they don't. Most people who used to, to work in malls, they don't work now. There's a, there's, there's a problem of food here in slums. Others are going without food. Others have to save for, for in order to get one meal. Next slide, please. Yeah, here by 7 a.m., all people are, are at home, but there's a, there's, a, there's a problem of theft. They use, the thieves take advantage. The youth take advantage. The thieves take advantage of the curfew time and steal from people before the curfew starts. The normal situation, open air market gets busy from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. Now, now destroyed. Most affected are women who sell by the roadside to make a living and improve household incomes. While the number of Kenyans working in, in the informal sector in high usually trapped in the most vulnerable selling. Selling said Frederick Lapierre, senior coordinator, they will suffer the most. He said March 12, 2020. And here, most of the people used to work, they were being paid one to two dollars per day. But now it has been very tough for them. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Transport has been disrupted, fares hiked, and beyond most commuters, there's social distancing in local small business. A 14-seater now carries seven passengers, 36-seater only, 20. The rest of the people will trek home. Landlords have increased rents, leading to more violence between tenants and landlords. Informal settlements are hit hardest. Example, Shimiseru looks for work by washing clothes, manual labor, anything that might bring in a couple hundred Kenyan shillings, one to two dollars per day. After a long day of searching for food, she returns home and fixes dinner of skumawiki and ugali. Green, greens and amazing. People are afraid that if, if you have come from outside, you could be bringing in coronavirus, she said. Work has stopped due to the virus and lockdown. Here, psychological, psychological pain 
is not feeding her family. Now experiencing hunger and depression, the landlord is on her neck to pay rent. Others are being evicted out of their houses because of unpaid rent. Thus, it has increased. It has increased the number the number of street families. Hence, to maintain social distancing there, it has been a problem. Next slide, please. Thank you so much, Ms. It was very interesting, and um, thank you for persisting. I know the connections are, are slow, and there's a bit of a delay, and but uh, thank you for putting a, a face on this and giving us the perspective of, of what is happening, especially uh, in the slums. Uh, Francesca, I turn it back to you to introduce our next speaker. I'm trying to unmute myself, okay. Thank you, Christine. Our next speaker is Dr. Reginald Malugala. He's the country coordinator for Kenya and is a professor at Sangaza University. Dr. Reginald is one of the pioneer members of the Golden African team and he's responsible for bringing in a number of uh, public and private sector participants from Kenya into the project. He's so passionate about this project and uh, I would like him to have the floor now and tell us what he's doing with his team in Kenya. Dr. Reginald, please. You are. I think you might have been on mute. Uh, You've been on mute now. But right now, you can just go into audio only if you're having challenges with your bandwidth or something. I see that he keeps going um, back on to mute. So perhaps there's um, a larger problem uh, with with his connection. Okay. Oh, now we can hear you. Okay. Is it okay now? Is it okay? Yes, perfect. Is it yes. okay now? Yes. Ah, okay. So what I can see is your screen, Christine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, I think here yeah, we are trying to see then from this discussion by Dr. Asma and Whitney, looking at the different perspectives, how can Voden uh, research contribute to policy making in a country like Kenya, that our research can contribute to the wider healthcare policy in Kenya, so that should we have a pandemic, we know what to do. For example, social distancing did not keep in mind uh, food distribution, work for in the informal settlement, people who are employed in the informal sector. So how do, can Vodan uh, research contribute to policy? And uh, as you heard from Whitin also, that most of the people who work in the informal settlement are women. And it's possible that uh, women are not working, so the ha households are uh, hungry. So how do we go about that? Next slide, please. Yes, how do we make fair data link with existing systems? Now, most of the stewards we have selected are experts in their own respective uh, government ministries and health centers. We hope that they can learn and align the training with their own systems so that they can keep data at the local level. The weekly workshops by Eric have been very helpful because they're helping to build the capacity and improve skills on data collection, storage, and access. Next, please. Next slide, okay. So on this last part here, we're looking at the question, would the virus outbreak data contribute to national policy formulation? And again, we may have to revisit what we mean by health. 
I think World Health Organization has come up with a very interesting definition as health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Well being refers to positive rather than neutral state, framing health as a positive aspiration. So, all of us aspire for positive health. So, when we say in Kenya that 720 persons are infected by the virus, we're not just looking at that population, but you're looking at the whole country. So if the whole country is going to be affected by this infection, how does that uh, contribute to policy making? So that the government can be prepared in future that should there be another pandemic, there can be low levels of marginalization, they can look at the question of the ethnicity, discrimination according to gender, that the, the poor can cope uh, in the lockdown so that they don't suffer from want and that they'll be reduced domestic violence. Next, please. Next. And so uh, if we look at the persons working in the informal sector in Kenya, 15 million, and 2.9 work in the formal sector. So if this uh, large population is affected and we have a lockdown, then we know that we have affected the almost 75% uh, of the economy. So how then do we make sure that whatever we are doing as Voden can actually bring out positive, positiveness in the country's uh, economic development? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you to all of the uh, speakers who just uh, spoke about what is happening in Kenya. Francesca, I turn it over to you. I thought you wanted to take the questions first. Thank you, Christine. So the next okay. team, we're going to be hearing from, yeah? Well, you oh, want to take the questions, but go ahead with it, yeah. I think just for uh, time, we are capturing all the questions in chat. We're going to go ahead with Ethiopia, and then um, at the end, we will uh, take some questions, and um, if the VC is still on, uh, his closing remarks. So hang in there, and thank you for your questions. This is, these have been very interesting presentations, and I know um, you'd like to hear more, and so we will do that at the end. All right. Thank you, Christine. So next, we're going to be hearing from the two key members of our Ethiopian team, Drs. Araya and uh, Wundimun. Dr. Araya is a professor of public health at Mekele University, and he also leads the Research Center for Maternal, Adolescent, Reproductive Health, and Child Health in the same university. He coordinates the digital health research and development at Mekele University. I can personally testify to the fact that Dr. Araya is a very strong supporter and a key member of the Bodan Africa Initiative. He has brought in a number of partnerships and they contributed so much to the initiative. And secondly, we have Dr. Wondimu Ayele Manano. He's a professor of biostatistics and health informatics, health informatics capacity building and mentorship project. He also directs the School of Public Health in Addis Ababa University. Professor Wondimo is widely published and is also a PhD fellow at the Institute of Medicine, Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Informatics at the Martin Luther University in Germany. Professor Wondimo is actually a country coordinator for Ethiopia. He coordinates Ethiopia with uh, Dr. Getu. So we're going to be hearing from the two of them and their perspective from Ethiopia on COVID-19 and uh, what they have been doing in the context of the Vodan Africa project, the future directions, what Vodan Africa means to them, to the COVID-19 and then beyond COVID-19. So Dr. Araya, please, if you go to the next slide. Yes. Okay, Dr. Wondimu is presenting first. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Francis. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, you and Mariam and uh, your team for uh, creating such a great platform to share experience and to strengthen COVID response in African region. 
and uh, I'm going to present uh, just a health information system and e-health implementation status in Ethiopia, including the challenge. And then following my presentation, Dr. Aria is uh, going to present um, COVID response in uh, Ethiopia. So uh, please, next slide. So my presentation outline is this, just I will try to provide a country profile and then I will try to talk about more in health information and uh, Ethiopian health sector transformation plan. Please, next slide. So uh, as you know, Ethiopia is the second largest country in Africa uh, with population size of 110 million. And uh, currently we do have uh, more than 27,000 public and private health facility. So most of the health facility is at community level because Ethiopia has a flagship of uh, health extension program by the uh, motto of uh, community produce their own uh, health. Uh, so uh, Addis Ababa University is one of the oldest and largest higher learning and research institution in Ethiopia. Currently, uh, we do have more than 15,000 undergraduate, postgraduate, and PhD students. We do have several PhD and master's program. And last year uh, in university rank, Addis Ababa University is 10th in Africa and served in sub-Saharan African country. And the school that I work for is a leading school in research and university as well in a country. And then most of the scholar and faculty members is currently participating in different uh, COVID response at national level. And also they are advising uh, the Ministry of Health and Regional Health Bureau uh, on, in terms of um, effective and tailored uh, intervention in order to contain the uh, rapid uh, uh, speed of uh, the virus. Next slide, please. Just to give you overview, Ethiopia uh, health system has three tiers. The first one is primary. The primary includes uh, health post, uh, health center, and primary uh, district, which serve for uh, about 100,000 population. And then secondary level is more uh, general hospital, which is uh, led by uh, zonal, because we do have a different administrative level. And uh, also uh, treasury level is special and comprehensive hospital. So those uh, is uh, led by some regional health bureau and also um, uh, federal minister of health, because uh, we do have 11 region, two city, uh, city administration, and nine regional uh, states, which is autonomous to control and to develop um, different intervention in their uh, perspective. Please, next slide. So just uh, to, to, to tell you that health sector transformation plan is adopted from sustainable development goal and country transformation plan with uh, core agenda. The first agenda is uh, maximizing quality and equity in healthcare, information revolution, WADA transformation, and strengthening health workforce, which provide uh, caring, respectful, and compassionate health uh, professional in order to achieve the vision, because the vision of health sector is to see, health, to see healthy and productive and prosperous Ethiopia. The unique uh, key feature of um, Ethiopian health sector uh, plan is uh, the first one is quality and equity, universal uh, health coverage and transformation. It has four pillars, excellency in health service delivery uh, and quality improvement assurance, leadership and governance and health system capacity. These four pillars is decomposed into uh, 15 strategic objectives. Please next slide. As you see, uh, the health information system is recognized as a one major agenda for health sector because uh, the, 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 the leadership believe that without health information is quite difficult to meet sustainable development goals. So this uh, transformation uh, plan has two pillars, transforming data use culture and digitalization. Then the principle is just transforming Warada. Warada is the lowest administrative, uh, the second lowest administrative level in, in Ethiopian um, uh, structure. And when we are able to transform health information system, then it's possible to transform uh, Warada. So in order to, this, uh, to do this, uh, it needs to strengthen health information governance, 
which is establish a health information system coordination platform and also uh, to monitor and evaluate uh, implementation of different health information system that exist in the country and uh, also is responsible to set standard procedure and protocols. Please next slide. So information revolution uh, the objective is maximizing availability, accessibility, quality, and use of health information with uh, six specific uh, objectives. The first one is improving method and practice of analysis, creating uh, data use culture, and improving data quality uh, with uh, different uh, in terms, uh, with different dimension. In, there are 10 dimensions which is identified in order to measure data quality like completeness, timeliness, accuracy, integrity, precision, and so on. So the other uh, specific objective is enhancing accessibility and visibility of health information system for the patient and also for wide the public. Because if uh, we don't create awareness uh, about health information system, it's quite difficult to get um, quality uh, data because the source of information uh, is the first source of information is the public or the community. And the other uh, specific objective is establishing an interoperable architecture and uh, use of or maximize utilization of information communication technology in order to transform uh, health information system in the country in order to make evidence-based uh, decision. Please, next slide. Uh, if you see, here is some of the initiative currently being implemented in the country, like telemedicine, teleeducation, uh, MLs for different program, uh, electronic uh, health management information system through uh, district health information system, uh, DHIS2, electronic logistic management uh, system, electronic um, public health emergency system. This is one of the system which we used in order to capture information for uh, COVID-19, uh, but still uh, it's not well established because as a beginning, uh, we have a timeline to, 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 to obtain a rumor or um, active uh, outbreak from the community, but currently uh, in FEM, they develop a DHIS tracker, but still it's not well functional. It's already uh, launched to, in order to uh, collect uh, in con contact case and um, intervention um, activities, but uh, it's not uh, fully implemented. And the other one is electronic medical record. And uh, one of the facilitator for interoperability is considered as master facility register, uh, national health data dictionary, and uh, also under plan to in order to uh, establish data warehouse that we call it health data depot and uh, also the other uh, facilitator in order to ensure interoperability is national uh, disease classification because currently we, we, we do have uh, about 2050 uh, national cases that identified or which is adopted from uh, ICT um, international classification disease 10. Please next slide. If you see here some of uh, initiatives uh, in order to ensure interoperability, uh, there are uh, Ethiopian health architecture that, that looks uh, shows future state. Some of them are uh, under development and some of them are uh, already functional. For example, facility survey like service provision and assessment survey, uh, integrated disease surveillance, uh, in, uh, electronic uh, logistic management information system and uh, electronic uh, health management information system, including um, community health management information system is fully functional, but uh, those, uh, for example, some of them are under development like uh, national uh, disease, uh, national health dictionaries under development. We categorize this in two terms. The one is in administrative level and the other is at service uh, delivery point because the major problem in developing country is, you know, data is collected just for the sake of reporting purpose. But uh, the, the, uh, as evidence, uh, data has to be used at the point of uh, data generation. Otherwise, it's quite difficult to bring change. Uh, in order, uh, uh, the, the, the data that's used at higher level is just simply for planning, monitoring, and evaluation. The country is also working in order to um, 
inter, uh, in, to make interoperable different sources of data that come from uh, population sources like uh, vital statistics, um, uh, census, and also some health survey like uh, demographic and health survey. And also we are uh, on the process in order to uh, integrate with health uh, data like education, agriculture, and meteorology data because uh, currently, one of uh, the hypotheses is uh, that the COVID uh, transmission is uh, varied uh, uh, by, by different um, uh, temperature conditions. Next slide, please. So this is just uh, uh, the other principle of the country health information system is connected Warada principle. This connected uh, Warada principle is just it show flow of information at different level at service for, uh, delivery point and also at administrative uh, level. Uh, now the Federal Minister of Health can access health facility data because uh, DHIS, the uh, District Health Information System is uh, already implemented in more than 95% of uh, health facility. That can be used as an opportunity in order uh, to, to, to uh, ca capture information from the lower level. Next slide, please. So there are also another principle because health facility and uh, WARADA are evaluated based on their performance. There is a criteria. The criteria is depending on data quality, information use, and HIS health information structure. So those health facility score less than 65 uh, given, in, uh, given standard considered as emerging and uh, those score 65 up to 19 is considered as candidate and those score above 19 is considered as a model. So in order to say model WRADA, all health facility under that WRADA has to send or access data offline. Then in such case, we call it uh, offline, uh, we call it model WRADA, but there are few WRADAs. I think it's not more than five or six WRADA currently they are model. And there is also connected WRADA. Connected WRADA when all health facility under, the WRAD, and, and under that WRADA is able to submit or access data online, then they can be considered as um, connected WRADA. Next slide, please. So still there is a challenge in order to establish a strong health information system in a country. The first challenge is, I think this can be true in, in all uh, developing country, close integration between public health and clinical care because demand for data is high. It's quite difficult to develop coherent and integrated harmonized information system in order to address the uh, need of uh, data for all stakeholders. And the other uh, challenge is impact of information technology on uh, confidentiality and privacy, because as you know, the health data is very sensitive and it needs, uh, it's, it's quite difficult to, for example, to store uh, data at cloud uh, due to the ethical issue. And the other um, challenge is uh, data quality and information uh, use uh, culture. It's determined by technical, organizational, and behavioral determinants, technical in terms of having a standardized reporting and recording format is quite difficult to address that one. And the other one is role and responsibility, including existing um, infrastructure is the other challenge in order to establish a strong health information system in a country. And the other uh, can be rapid transition of uh, information technology and also epidemiological transition because when you fix some standard uh, at the beginning, it's quite difficult to, to, to continue in such system. For example, uh, the Ethiopian health information system is redesigned in 2018 and then now there are so many new emerging diseases. So it has to be cop up that uh, with, with uh, this uh, new emerging disease in order to capture that one. So that is another challenge. Um, I think this is just the overview uh, from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. And I especially loved this slide. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Araya. Uh, I will talk on uh, uh, COVID-19 response in Ethiopia in relation to uh, digital health solution, uh, digital health uh, data. And 
uh, I will focus on the uh, strategic perspectives and then what kind of uh, data or different sources of data are being gathered for uh, COVID response in Ethiopia. Next slide, please. So as you all know that uh, the world is entering into uh, fourth industrial revolution. So one of the big uh, motivation or strategic uh, perspective for digital health to become a strategic priority or uh, a priority for Ethiopia is that uh, the future is with data, uh, with uh, the fourth industrial revolution. So Ethiopia has to get prepared for the future and catch up with the industrial revolution. As a, a book written on fourth industrial revolution by the World Economic Forum, uh, most of you, you might have uh, uh, read or you know that the world or humanity is entering into a new exciting uh, innovations in, through the data revolution. For instance, we'll have uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, 3D printing technology, even uh, researchers are working on a 4D uh, technology, we will have uh, advanced robotics like robotic surgeon and nurse in the near future. And also we will have uh, new materials, smart materials like self-healing, self-cleaning uh, technologies. And yeah, humanity will be completely different with, with all these new innovations and uh, technologies. And this fourth industrial revolution is completely or mainly dependent on data. And it said that data is a epicenter for this revolution. And we, data science is quite crucial for uh, extracting knowledge. And as someone from a university, from an academic, and uh, as an Ethiopian, uh, I strongly believe that the country has to start work on building a capacity and uh, training of data scientists data leaders and IT professionals. So the people of Ethiopia can cope up and catch up uh, with the revolution. So this is one of the main pillars. And of course, Wandum was mentioning about the different transformation agendas. And uh, one of the transformation agendas in the Ethiopian health sector transformation plan is uh, information revolution. So this is uh, priority or transformation agenda also supports us digital health, digital health data should be one of the strategic priority. And next slide, please. And the second uh, point or a reason why we need to collaborate and make digital health a priority is uh, to disrupt the status quo. Uh, Wandemu has mentioned the country health information system. However, uh, the current status or the Ethiopian health system is characterized by a centralized health system. Although in principle, the Ethiopian health policy uh, dictates for a decentralized health system, but in reality, our health system is uh, centralized, hierarchical, and also uh, people or clients or patients are less empowered, health professionals are less accountable, and the contribution and involvement of the private sector is almost nil. Uh, and our health system, like uh, most African countries, it is government and donor dominant and dependent. So we can say the current status quo of the Ethiopian health system can be defined as less sustainable, non-self-reliant and non-resilient health system. So with the new innovation, with opportunities of data science, digital technologies, we may have a good opportunity or a golden opportunity for disrupting the, uh, the current status and we may uh, get an opportunity for creating uh, a learning and a resilient health system. But for this, we need to build our uh, data science capacity. Next slide. And here, uh, I want to highlight uh, why we need uh, digital health data or uh, uh, digital technologies in line to COVID-19 response. Although Ethiopian, uh, the Ethiopian health system has made uh, uh, a big stride or impressive result in the past uh, couple of decades, 
Still, in a relation to this COVID-19 pandemic, it can be said the Ethiopian health system is too poor and weak to make an effective response to COVID-19. I can say that our health system is ill-prepared for the response. So uh, treatment cannot be considered as an option and the only three priority or three options we have for responding to COVID-19 pandemic is prevention, prevention, and prevention. And the response for COVID-19 in the Ethiopian should be designed or, or uh, should be spearheaded in the spirit of creating a resilient health system. This COVID pandemic has, has indicated how our health system has a lot of loopholes and how it is weak and every effort to respond to this COVID should be geared or designed in the principles of uh, creating a resilient health system. As WHO recommends, uh, isolation, testing, tra tracing and treatment are uh, key strategies for COVID prevention and containment. However, uh, because of a poor health system and because of our e poor economy, our hope is in identification, isolation, and contact, contact tracing. Uh, but to do this, to have an effective prevention, uh, we need real-time data. Uh, not only for identification, for isolation, and the contact tracing, <coughs> uh, even the, to have uh, uh, an effective preventive strategies, our strategies should be depend on uh, local and the cost contextual evidence. Our colleagues from Kenyan, they have been uh, clearly, excellently uh, el elaborating how uh, the economy factor is very crucial. The same holds for Ethiopia, like aggressive lockdown and stay at home cannot be an option for Ethiopia because of economic reasons. The many uh, citizens, they live on uh, daily income and it would be a great disaster if we follow uh, aggressive lockdown and stay at home. Next slide, please. So uh, what are the efforts that are being done to get data or evidence so that uh, to design COVID-19 response in the Ethiopian setting? I will focus on the case of uh, Tigray region, Ethiopia. I am from Tigray, Magala University is found in Tigray region and Tigray region is one of the nine regional states and it is the northern in Ethiopia. So the regional government, they are trying to, uh, to implement different initiatives so that we can have a good uh, data for COVID response. Uh, one of the major initiatives is the government, the Regional Health Bureau, has started an active community-based surveillance system, and the government has decided this surveillance system, house-to-house -house, uh, survey by the Ethiopian health extension workers, should be conducted twice a week. So the regional command post will receive an update on COVID-19 response or on COVID status in the region twice a week. The second uh, data source uh, is on having a screening in all health facilities, a kind of active surveillance at all health facilities. That means all health centers and hospitals will screen every client coming to their facility and report on the uh, status of uh, COVID. Uh, this is usually based on uh, the WHO guideline and it's not lab-based uh, screening, rather uh, based on the uh, sign and symptoms. The third uh, uh, source of data is the, the Regional Health Bureau is screening and uh, reporting all uh, incoming people through the airports and land borders. And there is also a periodic high-risk group rapid assessment and testing to high-risk uh, people like drivers, hotel and restaurant waiters, airport and airlines. This is like a proactive uh, high-risk assessment by the Regional Health Bureau and this is reported. Uh, the next uh, source of data that uh, uh, we are implementing is like uh, throughout the Ethiopia and also in the Tigray region, screening and mandatory quarantine for incoming travelers from other regions of Ethiopia and abroad. 
uh, is also implemented. What is somehow unique for the region is that it's not only people coming out of Ethiopia, but also people coming uh, from other regions of Ethiopia uh, are also screened and they stay under mandatory quarantine for 14 days. There is also a plan to have uh, aggressive contact tracing and isolation. Uh, so far, uh, uh, seven confirmed cases uh, of COVID in the region uh, are found or announced. Uh, in Ethiopia, by May 11, uh, a total of 250 confirmed COVID cases were found. So as the number of uh, COVID cases are increasing, then the contact tracing will be increased. There is also a toll-free, which is a kind of passive reporting, and this is also reportable and the regional health bureau may make a kind of quick and simple analysis. Uh, but the challenge, the challenge is all these uh, data sources are paper bed and uh, there is no mechanism of, uh, for integration of these different data source. There is no mechanism of uh, interoperability. So uh, efficient use of the data and sharing the data uh, is somehow a daunting. Uh, next uh, slide. Uh, as I have said, uh, the efforts in getting data sources or data for uh, COVID response so far is a kind of uh, paper bed. Uh, however, as the, the transmission of the virus, the spread of the virus is increasing, and as the country enters to the sustained community transmission, which is uh, inevitable, then uh, paper-based data collection or uh, surveillance system by uh, uh, health extension workers will be challenged because even going to house, house to house could be a reason for spreading of uh, the virus. And digitizing all these the data sources or the means of getting the data is, uh, is, is not questionable. Uh, everybody argues to digitize, uh, to, dig to digitize this different uh, means of uh, surveillance and uh, uh, reporting system. Uh, and the regional health bureau together with uh, uh, technology developers, private and uh, governmental technology developers, they, they, have, they, are already start, they have already started developing a surveillance app for the house-to-house -house surveillance, uh, also for the health facility. There, the, there is also a self-assessment app a checkpoint or entry point app, toll free app. And as one Duma has mentioned earlier, uh, the DHIS2 uh, tracker is also being customized for use. Uh, there is also an effort to develop a statistical analysis and data aggregation. There is also an interest to develop an app for contact tracing, but it's not yet uh, developed. The major challenge, although these different apps or digitization process are under, uh, under development and uh, uh, pilot process, one big challenge in relation to COVID response and to digitizing the Ethiopian health system and data use is the lack of unique identification. We don't have uh, a unique citizen ID and we don't have a means of digital, creating a digital unique identification. And with this challenge, getting a unique data and uh, in making the data coming from different sources interoperable and reusable makes it challenge. As you know, for COVID response, the data that is being gathered at screening uh, and at case management and at testing in the laboratory center should be uh, interoperable and should be in, uh, uh, integrated, but without having a digital uh, unique identification our hope might be uh, a wishful thinking. Next slide. So in conclusion, and uh, in relation to our partner partnership in uh, FAIR and Warden, uh, my colleagues and my, myself, I believe that we need to build our capacity in data science and make digital health a strategic priority for Ethiopia because we aspire to prepare the country for the future and we want to disrupt the current status quo and create a learning and resilient health system. And most importantly, we want to have 
better decision making with better knowledge, better skills, and better policy. In particular, in COVID-19 response, what we have learned over the past two to three months is that there is a lot of information. Decision makers are bombarded with a lot of information and publications, but making a decision which is which one is a better data, which one is a, an evidence, uh, a better evidence uh, is becoming challenging and making a decision by policymakers is also becoming frustrating. So we need to uh, have a better uh, mechanism of uh, decision making and to realize this aspiration, uh, we, we want, yeah, we, our active involvement in partnership with FAIR and the Voden uh, and applying for the FAIR and Voden principles into the Ethiopian uh, health elect health electronic health information system will play an indispensable role. And we want to learn and collaborate with all the FAIR and Voden partners on how to make interoperable and uh, the FAIR and verification of the different data source for COVID-19 response in the Tigray region, Ethiopia, which I mentioned earlier. And my colleague, Getu, uh, a junior bright colleague, is attending the trainers of, uh, the training of trainers. He, he's, he, after he finished and while he's taking the training, uh, he will uh, pass his knowledge in, into, uh, in, to his colleagues and to implement into the Tigray health system. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'll actually uh, stop sharing for a moment uh, and just uh, go back to a couple of questions. People were very interested in all of the presentations and I will do my best to um, get us through as many questions as we have time for, uh, just uh, respecting people's evenings and knowing they might need to drop off at some point. The, fe the first question goes back to Dr. Araya. Um, you talk about prevention, prevention, prevention. Um, in what ways has, has the effective preventative measures, in what ways are they being applied to Ethiopia? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what the government of Ethiopia uh, has chosen is as a prevention, uh, for instance, uh, a state of emergency uh, was declared. And, uh, so uh, land borders and uh, people coming from abroad, uh, they, they are being screened. And also uh, when there are suspects, they will go to uh, the quarantine centers. So there were, these are one of like uh, a major uh, countrywide step taken. But uh, also in the region, like uh, hand washing practice is uh, one of uh, the popular, uh, the government, the health system, or the Federal Ministry of Health is promoting uh, uh, hand washing and uh, social distancing. Uh, yeah, um, like uh, also in my region, in Tigray region, movement restriction was, uh, uh, was in place. Uh, but that movement restriction is currently being loosened. As a, uh, otherwise, for the past uh, one month, we had like a, a movement restriction. We uh, people were not allowed to move from city to city, from a ruler to from a ruler town to ruler town, from rural to urban uh, uh, city. So there has been a movement restri movement restriction. Public gatherings, like in church, mosques, uh, were also uh, prohibited, and funeral uh, process uh, 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 more. Uh, it was not allowed, like to have a funeral uh, for 50 and more people. So the number of people attending uh, ceremonies has been re reduced. Uh, yeah, uh, and also there is a debate on masking, universal masking. Uh, currently, uh, I think the government has accepted for universal masking, but it was not uh, mandatory. Thank you. Um, Maybe just to, just to add some uh, information, uh, because, you know, the, the, the response is uh, led by the prime minister and uh, for example, uh, you know, the transportation system is they reduce their capacity by half and all 
passenger should uh, use a mask that's mandatory, especially for uh, a transport system, as well in mass gathering, everybody in public place should use, particularly in Addis, because Addis is one of the EP center in Ethiopia. And um, uh, massive awareness creation is work by different volunteers. So uh, the, the problem is still in Ethiopia is, you know, the cases is still for the first uh, one month. Now we are uh, about uh, 272 by today and screening is also strong uh, and besides this uh, contact tracing is also uh, strongly um, implemented so the, everything is uh, the priority is given for the COVID response but the problem uh, in Ethiopia the other maybe it might be true in other African countries because the impact from other health service might be uh, very serious uh, because every attention is given for the COVID response but the other disease like chronic disease is uh, one of the major uh, problems. So in this regard, also the government uh, developed Q guideline in order to uh, provide, uh, you know, telemedicine and teleeducation for the follow-up. For example, in my uh, hospital, one of the largest hospital in Ethiopia, 60% of the patient, chronic patient is, you know, get service through phone by their uh, physician. So this is also one of the good opportunity. But the other issue is, you know, still um, uh, low utilization of health service, especially very few uh, health facilities identified for uh, COVID uh, response, but the others is, is still providing the ex existing um, service. Thank you. Um, uh, many people were also interested to hear, uh, especially when Dr. Araya mentioned that the involvement in, of the private sector in the digital health or the health system is almost nil. Um, as a country, how do you hope to ensure private sectors get more involved in the implementation of digital health systems in Ethiopia? Uh, actually, the private sector is better than public ser uh, sector. For example, in Addis case, most of uh, private sector, you know, most of their services provide through digital system and they are also agreed to report to the Federal Ministry of Health. Most of health facilities report uh, their uh, data to, to, to the uh, government uh, under, under uh, uh, their uh, area. So still the government is supporting public uh, private health facility. To, to digitalize and to uh, integrate with existing uh, public service. Because uh, uh, in 2018, you know, the, the health information system is designed by three principles, standardization, integration, and simplification. Standardization is, you know, all reporting and recording formats should be standardized. It should be used the same across all the health facility and uh, very few cases has to be reported to upper level and then data has to be used at, at the point of uh, data generation. Uh, another question is, uh, does Ethiopia's um, health management information systems plan to receive data from the public? So for example, what we might call crowdsourced or um, health related images coming from communities? Uh, not yet. Uh, uh, community health information system is being implemented in uh, community level because we do have more than 17,000 health posts and about 38,000 uh, health extension uh, worker uh, uh, providing, you know, uh, preventive and health promotion and uh, disease prevention activity. There are few uh, indicators which uh, come from community uh, level, but still we haven't established, you know, the just to capture image uh, from the community. Sure, sure. This next question is for uh, Dr. Reginald, um, who, who's asked, based on the objective of your work, what is your current perception of the impact so far? Sorry, come again? Oh, uh, the next question was for Dr. Reginald, and I know he was having some connectivity issues earlier, so. Now, now, now I'm okay, I'm okay, Christine. Oh, okay. Super. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so um, that's there are two questions on Aloyo. The one on impact, today the Kenya Banking Association estimated that um, there's 94% of economic slowdown. 
that's very high, 94% of economic slowdown. And then uh, Loy asked about the private sector. And we found that today also the family bank is giving out 1.2 billion Kenya shillings for stimulating micro, small, and media medical enterprises. And that includes all digital health. Wonderful. Well, we all hope that um, has a tremendous impact. The, the next question comes um, uh, for Whitney. Um, the, one of the uh, participants asked if you could say a little bit more about what you mean when you say radicalized youths. Um, is this about um, political participation or I think I know what you meant, but um, just wanted to give you a chance to say more. And I know uh, you, there was a long, a long lag um, with your network as well. So if we'll just give a quick pause and see if you can hear us. Okay, well, we're if, if not, uh, well, I could ask the internet connection problems. Um, as Tangaza, we do research in Kamkunji. Kamkunji uh, sub county has been the epicenter of recruitment to radicalization, Al Shabab, uh, ISIS, and all that. So, what we did is come up with an alternative approach to helping the youth look for alternative means of, of coexistence. So, the youth have moved away from radicalization to small and medium enterprises. Some of them have set up art centers, some of them are doing washing, some women are making cakes. Some of them are doing a carpentry, welding, and all that. So the radicalized youth are being given opportunities to lead a different alternative life. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. Um, and I'll just take a couple last questions. I apologize that we couldn't get to every single one, but I wanna make sure we have a, a few minutes for our esteemed guest, the Vice Chancellor. Um, let's see, the last questions uh, for, are for Dr. Asma. Uh, let's see here. Um, in other places, the elderly are at risk. In your presentation, you showed there was a pattern in Kenya that especially looked at people between the ages of 30 and 50 being the highest number of cases. Could you comment a bit more on that, Dr. Asma? Uh, pardon? We can hear you. Uh, I, I want you to repeat the question, please. Sure. Um, in other countries, we hear that the elderly are most at risk. In your slide, the most of the cases were in the 30 to 39 and 40 to 49. So if you could comment. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we, we still have the elderly being affected, but not uh, majorly. Most of our cases, over 75% are asymptomatic and from, they are from that young age group. Oh, that is a good point. Yes, that's right. You, it was uh, in the 70% range, the asymptomatic cases. Yes. And so it's yes. not a matter of who is um, uh, suffering from the symptoms of COVID, but who is uh, the care, who are the carriers. And so that- Oh, the carrier, yes. Yes. Oh, well, wonderful. Thank you so much uh, to the speakers. Uh, this has been extremely interesting and illuminating. And as we've learned more, there are only more questions. We want to know so much. And so, um, we thank you also for participating in Vote in Africa and for uh, take, keeping track of this important data. As one of our speakers said, data should not just be for reporting, it should be for um, timely decision making and for helping uh, with the prevention, prevention, prevention and ensuring that um, all countries are safe. Because I think as uh, was Dr. Reginald who said, none of us will be safe until we are all safe. Uh, so with that, Francesca, let me turn it over to you to introduce our last speaker for some thoughts. And then at the very end, I will put up a slide uh, about next week. Thank you, Christine. I would like to invite the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Kampala International University, Professor Chukwemeka Diji, to give a brief opening remark on behalf of the University of Kampala International University that is leading the Bodan Africa Initiative. Yeah, thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I want to thank you on behalf of my vice chancellor for today's presentation. I think I've learned quite a lot about Kenya and Ethiopia. And I want to also thank the specific speakers 
for their contributions. Especially Dr. Asma, you gave us quite some interesting information about Kenya, which are quite good. And uh, we would love to, maybe in future presentation, to see some more gender flair, because gender has come out to be one of the major issues arising from COVID in terms of political leadership, in terms of health workers, in terms of fatality. One of my Nigerian friends initially when COVID started said it must be a woman because all the things that affect men have been canceled. And for the first time, every woman knows where her husband is. So we might be needing to know more about the gender perspective. I also want to thank our young student, Christine, who talked about social distancing challenges. Although she didn't do much about that, she simply did more talking about the challenges of COVID itself within a particular community. I was waiting to see what the social distancing challenges were, but I think she was more interested in talking about the impact in terms of youth and the reaction of the youth to COVID. So I would encourage you to look more at that subject of social distancing. We really want to know what the challenges are. My friend, Dr. Reginald, he gave us quite a lot of information and, uh, and he looked at the issue of policy. We were also expecting that probably you give us some perception based on what has happened so far. What policy in Kenya will probably change? What policies will remain? What are the existing policies and how will it affect, how will it disrupt some of these policies, particularly in area of gender and socioeconomic and, uh, and uh, social circumstances. For well, the other case, we thank you because those three presentations have given us some idea of what is happening in Kenya. For our friends in Ethiopia, it's a very interesting thing to know that you have a very robust health information system. And privately, I was discussing with one of the participants from Ethiopia who was saying that this, this policy has been implemented 100%. Although I have not been convinced to what extent this implementation has helped in managing COVID-19. There are still issues about data aggregation and collation. How effective are they? And to what extent are you getting those information? He's talked a lot about the issue of uh, prevention and, um, you know, he's talked a lot about how these systems are. But we still need to find out, are we at the point of good intentions or are we at the process of complete full implementation and we are now doing monitoring and evaluation. So our friend, uh, Dr. Raya, will be very glad to see if you can do more work on that for future presentation. So Dr. Raya, I think he said something which is very important, and which I wanted us to note, that data is the epicenter of the fourth industrial revolution. I mean, this is apt and this is quite true. So we shouldn't look at data in those regards. But we also need to know more what these preventive measures, how effective they are in terms of effective identification, isolation, and contact tracing. Because you complain that uh, Ethiopia can't go the way of Kenya aggressively. Is there any proof to show that your method is better? Is there any way to show that probably your approach is going to yield better results? Because COVID is still something that is ongoing. Are there signals to show that this approach is better? So on behalf of our Vice Chancellor, I want to thank all the speakers. I want to thank uh, Christine for putting this together. And of course, I want to thank our Director, Francisca, who has been the Executive Coordinator for your job well done. So thank you all for taking part and I will convey your best wishes to my Vice Chancellor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very, very- The last uh, wants to say something. Oh, yes, please. Uh, Dr. Asma, you wanted to say something? Uh, thank you very much for the invite. It was a lovely uh, presentation. Yes, thank you to uh, all of the speakers. Um, uh, should you not be part of the Bodan network, I just want to uh, put, put up very quickly, here's a, a link that you can go to learn more about it, as well as Bodan Africa. Uh, please consider keeping your next Thursday evening free for us. 
we will meet back up again. And we next week we will have a focus on Zimbabwe and Tunisia, and we will try to pick up some of the same themes about the importance of data in the fight against this current outbreak. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for being part of this movement. And uh, stay well. Uh, see you next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.